Now, Roberts was sharing with, he, with me in the back that he's been seeing more healings in his meetings lately. Uh, he's been seeing the miraculous happen more in his meetings lately. We love that. So we're very excited about God showing up and uh, the God of power showing up. We just want to invite everybody to stand to their feet tonight. Let's welcome the Lord tonight. Let's just lift our hands to heaven, first of all. Oh, yeah, we set our mind on things above tonight. We want to thank you, Holy Spirit, for beginning to come. Oh, thank you, Lord, for your presence. I thank you that in your presence is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. I want to thank you tonight for beginning just to fill this place with your manifest glory presence right now. Lord, let it begin to hover just like the beginning. Holy Spirit, come on and brood in this place. Begin to move in this place. We thank you right now, God, for taking us higher, Lord. We thank you for songs of ascension, Lord, that we would ascend into the heavenly places, that we would begin to move in the Spirit tonight. I thank you for a corporate anointing, a corporate glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I thank you that there's healing in your glory tonight that there's freedom in your glory tonight. I want to thank you that there's life and liberty and deliverance in your glory tonight. Lord, it's all in your glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for coming like the rain. I see the Lord coming like weather patterns. I thank you for coming like the rain tonight. I thank you for blowing like the wind in this place. I thank you, Lord. Oh, God of glory, begin to thunder. Thunder in this house. I hear the thunder of the Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We exalt you, King Jesus, tonight. You are Lord of everything. You are enthroned in our hearts. I thank you that you come in many ways and you come in many forms. But tonight, I just thank you for coming as King. Be King in our hearts tonight. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Well, come on, get out of your seats if you can. Make yourself a little bit of space to move around. Hallelujah. Let's just worship the Lord for a little bit here. Amen. Come on, Zach.
Anybody alive tonight? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold. Like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old, your love is enduring through the winter rain, beyond the horizon, with mercy for today, and faithful you have been, faithful you will be, you pledge yourself to me. And it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips. Your father, the orphan, your kindness makes us whole. You shoulder our weakness, and your strength becomes our own. You're making me like you, you're clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes. But you will have your bride, free of all her guilt, and rid of her shame and known by her true name and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips. You will be praised.
is jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me And oh, how he loves us all Oh, how he loves us How he loves us so He is jealous He is jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory Now realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me And oh how he
father saw in the days of old would you do it again would you do it again all the stories told all the miracles would you do it again would you do it again all our father saw in the days of old would you do it again would you do it again all the stories told all the miracles would you do it again? Would you do it again? And you said, consecrate yourselves to me. And you will see amazing things. Sing that again. Consecrate. Consecrate yourselves to me. And you will see amazing things. In the days of old, would you do it again? Would you do it again? All the stories told, all the miracles, would you do it again? Would you do it again? And you said, Consecrate yourself to me.
Holy Spirit fire burning ever brighter in our souls kings and kingdoms falling healed people calling king of kings we need a miracle we need the revival brighter in our souls kings and kingdoms calling healed people calling Let's lift our belief level or we are believing to leave this week different, to leave this week changed, or we're believing for something to happen this week, Lord. Tonight, Lord, we invite you, Lord, tonight. Well, let's just open up our hands to him. Let's stretch out our hands. Lord, would you come down here? Would you flood in here like Alex was feeling at the beginning of the service? I asked for a downpour. Come on, I asked for an outpouring, or we asked for that. Would you surprise us, God? Would you surprise us, Lord? We are a dry and weary land. We need you. If you're feeling dry and weary, he's bringing his outpouring to you. That's what this is about. That's what tonight's about. That's what this week is about. We declare over you, outpouring into your life flooding into your life, watering into your life. Yeah, just begin to pray in the spirit right where you're at. Yeah, just begin to receive. Yes, Lord, we open up for more. Come on, lift it up.
need your revival. We need your revival. Our nation needs your revival. Our nation needs your economics. Our nation needs your move. Our nation needs your wisdom. But Father, we recognize tonight, Lord, we need that Holy Spirit fire to burn all the brighter in us personally, Lord God. Individually, Lord God. Individually, Lord God. As the church, Lord God. We want to burn all the brighter. We want to burn all the hotter, Father. And we're praying, Lord, we're proclaiming over this city. We're proclaiming over this nation. Let king and queens fall and let Jesus rise. Let Jesus rise through men and women, through his own body. And I saw today, I was awakened out of my sleep last night. And I saw a vision. And I saw, uh, I saw a mist. I saw a cloud. I saw a dew hanging over the entire nation. And I said, God, what is it? He says, it's my glory that I'm ready to release over this nation. And it was that sticky, that wet dew that represents the glory. And God said to Israel, I'll give you the dew of heaven. I'll give you the fatness of heaven in the earth. Right? That's what the Lord is proclaiming right now. He's saying, I'm ready to bring it down. I'm ready to pour it out. But you know what the next thing he told me in this vision was? He told me, Stephen, there has been a people, there has been a remnant in America that has been crowning me, that has been crowning me through a prayer movement, been crowning me through a worship movement. They've been crowning me through a praise movement. For the Lord our God, the God of Israel, is enthroned. He is crowned in the praises of his people. And no matter who the land elects, no matter who a nation elects, Jesus is still king. And because he has a remnant in every nation that will not stop crowning him, that will not stop crowning him with worship, crowning him with praise, he will rise up, I believe. He will rise up in every nation. Nothing can stop his emerging kingdom. The king is among us. Come on, enjoy it right now. Jesus, Jesus, you're worthy. You are king. You are king. Come on, let it rise. And the king is among us. And his glory surrounds us. And his fire is falling as we sing. And the Savior is for us. And his glory is victorious. And his We say that tonight that you would be king of our lives, or that you'd be king of our city, or that you'd be king of our nation. What we do, we crown you, Jesus. We crown you afresh in our own lives. Jesus, we want you in every place, in every area, any unreached place in our hearts, any uh yeah any place that you still that you still need to uh, reach out to lord we invite you lord we invite you jesus 
but we desire that we want you to be king. Prince of Peace, we thank you, Lord. Yeah, the Lord's wanting to minister to you tonight. He's wanting to minister his love to you. The Savior is for us. The song reads, the song sings. Well, we're, we, don't, uh, we don't sing during these times because it's just song time. We sing because it's such good news that it's the only appropriate response. You just start singing. It's not song time. If we actually had a real revelation of what we were talking about, what we were singing about, we wouldn't be able to help ourselves. Our hearts cannot help but react in joy. Oh, we love you tonight. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for what you have for us. Come on, God has something for you, something supernatural for you. Not a nice message, not a nice meeting, not a nice worship time. The God of the universe is here, and he's leaning into your life. Come on, you can just begin to open up to him in a new way. Come on, Lord, we open, we do, we open up our hearts to you. Oh, we want to leave here believing different, thinking different, rearrange everything. Come on, come on. Holy Spirit, would you just move in our lives? Would you move on hearts tonight? Yes. We just speak to all the people watching from at home, all the web streamers, that God would begin to fill your house. Come on, that God would begin to fill your bedroom, your living room, wherever you're watching from, that there would be a presence that would come. Come on, we're, the whole purpose of this all is for a person. The whole purpose of everything that we're doing is for a presence to come into our lives. We just release that into your lives tonight, into your homes this evening. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Yeah, there's an expectation in the room. You guys are bringing it. You guys are bringing that hunger, that, that desire, that attention that blesses the Lord. You guys really are bringing that, and it's affecting the Lord's heart. He loves that so much. Oh, we love you tonight, Lord. We love you with our whole lives, Lord. We ask that you would come in a special way this evening. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Come on. This is, this is, a, this is a meeting where the Holy Spirit is celebrated. This is a meeting where the real you is also celebrated. The actual, your true identity, not the things that people have spoken over you, negative things your whole life, but actually the real you. Thank you, Lord, for all the sons and daughters in this room tonight. We thank you, Lord. Uh, many generals are going to be even raised up, people believing, Lord, that God's going to burst something through their life, that God's going to move through their life. God's wanting to move through you. Do you know that? Come on, not just 100 years ago, but actually through your life today, God is desiring, he's anticipating, he's waiting for a group of people to actually believe him, to take him up on it. Do I have any believers in the room tonight? Any sons and daughters in the room tonight? Come on, mature sons and daughters of God. Come on, what if the next big move of God in your city, in our city, was going to come through you? Come on. Am I believing for this? Come on. Great signs and wonders breaking out through your life. All creation is groaning for the true you to be revealed. Come on. Not some other great hero of the faith that you're looking toward, that you're looking to to get the job done. All of creation is groaning for the real you to be revealed. We speak that over you tonight. We declare that over you. The truth of the Bible, the truth that God says over you. All creation's groaning. It's saying, come on, Stephen. Come on. <laughs> saying, come on, Alex. 
Come on, Scott. Come on, Casey. Come on, the real you. He's calling forth to you. That's what this whole week is all about, is some hungry people coming together, honoring what has happened to see, to believe that God might do it afresh again. Anybody believe and forgot to do it afresh in your city, in our city, in your life, in your neighborhood, in your family? We're believing you, Lord. We're taking you at your word tonight. Anybody taking God at his word, placing a demand on his word? Come on. We will not be disappointed. We might be disappointed if we reach out and grab hold of hype, but if we reach out and grab hold of him and his word, we will never be disappointed. Come on. God's wanting to move through you way more than you're desiring for it. And you desire for him, to, for him to use you. It's amazing what God's going to do through your life. We thank you, Lord, for the incredible people here tonight. You guys are awesome. God's speaking that over your life in Jesus' name. Amen. So good. So good to have you all with us. So good to have the Lord with us. So good to have Robert Slierden in the house with us this evening. Very honored to have him with us. Um, and I want to invite anybody that's sitting in the back, you guys can come on up. Let's come up and fill up this, this front section. We got like three rows right here in this middle front. You guys in the back, come on up here. That's right, I'm talking to you. Come on up here. That's right. Val, I'm talking to you. <laughs> uh, you guys come on up here. We want to we wanna come in and get in close. We want to come in and get hungry like a family. Is that all right? This is a place where it's safe to be hungry for revival. It's safe to be hungry for more of the Holy Spirit. It's safe to be hungry for outpouring and the miraculous. This is a place where that is celebrated. That's the only way to really be. That's the only true Christian life. Hey, guys, I want to let you know, did you guys know that Roberts is going to be with us each night this week? Did you guys know that? 7 p.m. each night this week. And uh, so just like most of our meetings, it grows over time, and it grows each night. So, man... Uh, come tomorrow night, Thursday night at 7, bring a friend. Friday night at 7, Saturday night at 7, and Sunday morning he'll be with us. Not only that, but he's also going to be teaching in the School of the Supernatural tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And so we want to invite you to join us tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. It's open to the public, but there is a $10 drop-in fee. And so uh, you will be able to just show up tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. sharp. We're going to get class started. And Roberts is saving some really special stuff uh, for just the school. So we want you guys to be a part of that, to get in on that. Um, uh, a very, very good teaching is going to be happening tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. It's going to be awesome. Uh, really quickly, we also have, um, we've been taking on this endeavor of uh, uh, feeding homeless people. We've actually been, uh, that's something that's very much close to the Lord's heart, taking care of the needy. And so we actually have a pantry in the back right corner. If you look back there, we got this idea from Jason Hooper. He has actually started a great move. I know you're going to be speaking at Jason soon, one of our good friends, Jason Hooper. And, uh, well, we, he got the idea from the Lord. Uh, but anyways, and, and so we felt it was for the Lord too. So we have a pantry over there in the back. And uh, in addition to that, there is a, a sheet. So if you'd like to give, maybe you can't go out. Uh, maybe you're busy, but maybe you can, um, maybe you can give to the sheet. And uh, it, so specific items will be bought uh, for the homeless. And, uh, or maybe you can bring some of those items this week. We want to see uh, the supernatural. We want to see a culture of honor. We want to see a prophetic lifestyle be released um, to the needy as well. So anyways, that's an opportunity. There's a sign-up sheet in the back. And uh, I'm now going to welcome up Mr. Robert Slierden. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Good job, brother. Hi, everybody. You may be seated. Is that rain again? Well, we'll take a prophetic sign if God's going to give us that rain, all right? You may be seated. So good to be back here. Wow. Praise the Lord. I feel like I'm in Africa. I'm on those t 10 buildings. It goes like that. Well, I'm going to be here this week. I have been looking forward to coming back since I was here the last time. And uh, can everybody hear me okay or should you turn me up a little bit? Give me a little monitor if I could a little bit. That'd be great. So we're very uh, excited to be here all week. I brought with me a couple treasures that I'll be showing the students tomorrow. I've got Wigglesworth's Bible with me. 
and Captain Coleman's passport with me tomorrow. So I thought, I'll bring some of my treasures so you can see them, as we'll be talking about all the things. I'll be talking a lot about why they made it and why some failed, and uh, going through some more details of um, why did these guys do great things, and if they did something stupid, why did they do the stupid stuff? So you can learn from their successes and their mistakes, so you can be better at it in our generation, amen? And so a lot of people, well, I only want to hear the good stuff, and that's why you did the bad stuff. You got to hear both, amen? And sometimes learning not what to do helps to do what you're supposed to do better, amen? Because sometimes your friends say do this and it's not the way to go. And you'd be able to stand on the word and be able to stand against your friends and do what's right no matter what's going on, amen? It's not how you start that counts, it's how you finish that counts. You should write that down. Most people think, wow, no, it's not how you start, it's how you finish, amen? And everybody great has done something stupid. Write that one down, that's how there's hope for you and I, okay? So there's no such thing as a perfect person, it's a person who's been forgiven, and learn from their mistakes and keeps on going. Amen? Amen. Open your Bibles tonight from, to the book of Hebrews chapter 10 and 11. We'll start there. Now, I brought all of my books. I've written 78 books, and most of them are back there. Uh, here's a book I wrote, How to Sharpen Your Discernment So You Don't Marry an Idiot and Do Business with a Christian Crook. Uh, I wrote that after pastoring for a few years in California because I got tired of marrying idiots who divorced two years later and lived in hell and lived in my office for most of life. So I said, before you start kissing, start discerning. Yeah, okay, you'll get that next year, all right? So there's that. And then I wrote this book. There's three books in one. The first book, How to Get Free from Controlling, Manipulating People. The second book is How to Survive an Attack. Most folks don't know what it is until after their dogs ran off their own Prozac and their family's falling apart. And it's a good book. And then the third was How to Say No and Not Feel Guilty. Um... If Samson would have said no, Judges would have been a bigger book. It's one of the smallest books in the Old Testament because Samson didn't live out as all of his allotted days. He had a great ending moment, but not a great life. And God wants you to have a great life, not just some events in your life. That's the difference between being great and just have a few good moments. A great life is longevity. Amen. And then, have you ever heard of Sister McPherson? I've got a couple of her books back there that I've uh, helped bring back into print that I thought you might want to read. Here's one called uh, Her Sermons on the Second Coming of Christ. You know, a lot of folks don't know if the Lord's coming back or not, but I still believe the Lord's a coming. Uh, I'm glad the pastor is. I don't know about the rest of you. If you don't want to go, then just stay right where you are. But if he comes, I'm taking off. And uh, how to, so you'll enjoy some Amy stuff. And then I have a brand new book. And you're the first one to get it tonight. It's Generals uh, Volume 6. It's out. just came out today. And uh, this is on the great martyrs of the church, those that were killed for their faith. And uh, so it's kind of like Fox's Book of Martyrs, but it's the Laird and Trans Trans uh, edition. I was watching ISIS kill our brothers and sisters in the Middle East, as we all did on television. And uh, it provoked me to go back and to begin to read the stories of those that have died for the faith from the New Testament, early church, and all the way through. And uh, so I went and pulled out stories that I liked. I pulled out not just men, but women that were killed, children that were killed, and families that were killed because of their faith. And so we put all these together here, and we end with uh, the killing of the 12 uh, Christians that ISIS killed on the beach of Libya. We tell you their story. And uh, one of the guys that was killed after them was a, a, a guard that guarded these 12 guys. And uh, he was told not to believe what they were believing, but he goes, I believe what they believe, and they killed him for it. So one of the guards that took care of the guys had got saved, and they killed him too. And so there's a special place in God, uh, God's heart for the martyrs, and there should be a special place in our heart for martyrs today too. And here's a, a, a fact that you may want to remember. There are more being killed today for their Christian faith than in ancient times. Somebody today or several hundred today was imprisoned, abused or hurt physically, and killed for their faith today in our worlds. It is so common that no one talks about it. 
It is so important, unimportant, they don't discuss it. But there are people who today died because they wouldn't give up their faith in Christ. And you got bothered by the rain. <laughs> kind of put that in perspective. I love being a Western Christian. I just don't want Western comfort to temper my faith and my ability to obey God. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And uh, I wish that more Western Christians would travel. I wish they would more interact with what I call the oppressed church. We are the victorious, prospering church of Christian in the West. But when we meet the, the Chinese church or those in foreign countries that are oppressed, you meet the underground or the oppressed church. They're both of God, but they operate in two different worlds because of what, how our cultures are. I love being American. I love being a Western Christian. But I'm not disrespectful to the views and those that have lived under the oppression of governments and demonic powers and governments and how they view things. They have a, a different grit to their faith that we didn't need or didn't require us to have here. So these two groups one day are going to meet. I hope I live long enough when the West meets the oppressed and there's going to be kaboom and we're going to take the blessing from both groups and adjust in both groups. Amen. But I hope you go by and get my new book and enjoy it. And I wrote it for, to help you to pray for the people and to have a special honor to them. We talk about how the Nazis killed Christians there. We talk about all those things that happened in Europe in the, in the Reformational time. Uh, so we talk about all those, the death squads of the Roman Empire. Did you know about there was death squads that went out? We talk about how the apostles all died. All, uh, apost all 11 apostles died a martyr's death. Only one died a natural death. That was St. John. They were beheaded. They were skinned. They were chopped up. They were fed to animals. And they didn't give up their faith. St. Paul had his head chopped off. And Peter was crucified upside down. And you think, why? Because he says, I don't deserve to die in the manner of my Lord. So they crucified him upside down. And that's how he died. Did you know that Peter had a wife? He had a mother-in-law. He had to have a wife. And history tells us he had a little girl. That he had a little girl. Did you know that? So one of our apostles had a family and a child who lived out her faith as well, too. And so we were so glad that we have the stories of these people to inspire us. Amen? Amen. Tonight I want to preach uh, a message from the Scripture. Usually, and I came here last time, I uh, did all the revival stuff, and I'll do that this week, too. But I, I want to kind of journey in a thing because uh, we talk about the great acts of men and women of what we call recent times, and I love doing that. That's part of my call. But we don't always uh, discuss certain things I want to discuss with you, like tonight, uh, on the subject of faith. Christianity is built on the, on the matter of faith. Faith should not be mystery to anybody. Faith is a controversy. If you are intellectual and you are emotional, the secular and the non-spiritual Christian world will adore you. But if you begin to walk by this thing called faith, you become controversial right up front. And everything that we do in Christian is done on the basis of our faith and our strength of our faith. You get saved by faith. You hear God by faith. You obey by faith. You overcome by faith. Everything is by faith. So you should always be growing your faith so that your life is a greater light. I say, well, Brother Roberts, I want an anointing. You know what I want? I want bigger faith. Bigger faith gets great anointings. They used to, I grew up in the, what we call the word of faith movement. In those days, they used to criticize you. Are you one of those faith guys? Are you a hyper faith person? And I thought to myself, if there's hyper faith, I want it. If there's nuclear faith, I want that too. Whatever kind of faith there is, I want that kind of faith. Amen. So I never got bothered by the labels that you're a hyper faith guy or you're what? So yeah, I'm hyper and I love it. I'm supersonic and I love it too. I, I like it all. But in Hebrews chapter 10, you got your Bibles? Everybody smile. There's no damnation coming so you can relax and enjoy the message tonight. It says in Hebrews 10 and 38, the just live by faith. It's not something that you just borrow or it does not come like an anointing. It is a residential force that lives in your belly. A person of faith is like a rose 
that blossoms in the middle of a desert for some strange reason. There's not enough water for a rose to be. There's not enough reason for that type of flower to be in a dry and, and, and dusty land. But somehow that rose comes up out of dry soil and blossoms into a beautiful flower that everybody admires and goes, wow. That's how faith is in society. It is a rose that blossoms in the middle of a desert for some strange reason that most folks don't get. Faith is an energy. It is a substance that rises up inside of you that gives you the ability to believe and do the impossibilities. It is a force that works like that. Hebrews 11, 6, give you another verse as I open this up uh, to you tonight. Without faith... It is impossible to please him. Now, stop right there. That is a very bold statement. It is impossible to please God without this thing called faith. So in all your learning and all your getting, get and grow your faith. It is the foundation by which everything supernatural rests upon. It is not in addition. It is where the gifts set, where the anointing sets, where the miracle sets, where the vision, it all sits on this thing called faith. Now, I normally teach faith by principle because that's how I learned it. Number one, who has faith? How does faith grow? I've always taught it that way. But I learned that this generation that is alive today, they don't get principles like we did when I was your age. Now, I'm 50, so I'm not that old yet. But I'm older than some of the students sitting here. And so we would sit and hear Brother Hagen and Brother Copeland in the Faith Revival teach Hebrews 11, 1 for five days, twice a day for a whole week, and then they'd say, I'm not done, come back next year. I'm like, how much can you get out of Hebrews 11, 1? But there's a lot of going on in that faith message. So I learned it that way. But then I've, I've learned that teaching it that way sometimes does not work really good in the, in, to get the spirit of a person. And so I want to teach it a little different from you tonight. I want to look like I'm going to interview one of the great people that I've done hundreds of interviews in my life and ask them questions. If you want to ask anybody in the Bible about faith, I would think, who would it be? Christ would be number one, but there is a person that stands up above everybody else where three main religions, speaking secular now, claim him as their father of faith. Islam, Christianity, and Judaism all claim Abraham to be their example and the origin of how they are to walk by faith. So if there's anybody besides Jesus to ask, what is faith? I think it'd be Abraham. He is probably the most popular human that has ever walked the face of the earth, even to this day. Close to three billion people claim him as the father and the example of their faith. There's over a billion Christians, a billion Muslims, and I don't know how many uh, Jewish people there are. I don't think there's a billion of them, but close to probably three billion people today claim and know the story of the man named Abraham. So if there's any person you should ask that question to, what is faith? It would be Abraham. And so I'm going to ask him that question, and I'm going to teach you faith from the life of Abraham for the next three hours. Unless you amen me, okay? If you amen me, I'll, I'll quit sooner. <laughs> Notice only have you with amen. Oh, God. Yeah, well. Abraham, besides being the father of faith, he was a man that birthed a dispensation called the dispensation of promise. He birthed a nation, the Jewish people, and he helped birth 
a new species of people called the believer, besides being the father of faith. His family tree goes back to Noah. So you follow Abraham's family genealogy. So I'm sure there'll become a time when Abraham was a little boy and his dad would sit around the table with his family and go, you know, back a few generations ago, three or four of them, we had a crazy guy in our family named Noah. It's amazing how Noah did something great and the people after him forgot all about it. It's interesting how faith can live big in a generation and die in their children and not go to their grandchildren and then it'll jump four or five generations and find somebody new when it should be every generation getting bigger. But Abraham comes from one of Noah's sons. He comes from the son of Shem. And down the genealogy of Shem comes this man named Abraham. Abraham's family, when he was alive, were pagans. They lived in a city called the Earl of the Chaldees, which in ancient times was a developed city of the time. So he came from a modern type of city. His family's occupation was in paganism and heathenism. They were in the making of idols. So Abraham grew up knowing how to make idols, how to sell idols because that was the family job. So Abraham did not grow up with faith or the knowledge of God or much remembrance of God except for somewhere back in our family this guy built the boat and him and his kids and his wives, eight of them, survived and kept all the animals. And, you know, when you see the rainbow, that's because of our family. And that's how they talked about it. They didn't talk about who he walked with, how he talked about God. That was not in their conversation. When a generation loses the knowledge of God, they talk about accomplishment without God in it. So they all would say, he built a big boat and saved the animals. They wouldn't tell you that God told him how to build it because they forgot that part. Like some of the ancestors of great preachers go, well, they were famous. Well, they don't know why they were famous. They're just famous, you know, people. They had big crowds and, you know, they wrote a few books. And, well, they forgot the God part because they're heathen already. So Abraham comes along in the family with no knowledge of God. And if he was sitting here on this stage and I'd look at him and I'd say, Abraham, what is faith? How how would you explain faith to us? And I think you could start to go to Genesis 12 now. And you find the beginning of his story. It says in Genesis 12 and 1, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country. Leave your kindred and your father's house and go to a land that I will show you. He would look at you being an old man. He says, You want to know what faith is? He says, you know how hard it was to be the father of faith? Nobody in my family had faith. They served darkness and paganism. They lived like heathen with no moral conscience. He said, in the middle of that dark heathen land that I lived in and grew up in, one afternoon I heard a voice from another world. What is faith? It's hearing God when nobody else around you is listening or hearing either. What is faith, Abraham? It's the ability to hear God in the midst of the darkness and not allow the darkness to be the voice that you hear. He said, I heard God in the midst of idol-making parents immoral societies. And he told me something that was unusual. Get up and leave. Now, there are many people who could say, I heard God. But that's where most of them stop, even here in this room and you that are watching me. What is faith, Abraham? It's doing what you just heard God say. How many people in this room heard God 20 years ago, five years ago, 
and they knew it was God's voice, and they still haven't done it. But yet, you clap, and you worship, and you jump around, and you do things, but you haven't done the thing God told you to do. <laughs> and you're talking about faith now. This is the faith life. Faith is hearing God in darkness paganism. And then secondly, Abraham would tell you, it's the ability to get up and do what he told you to do. Now, Abraham, it says here, he was told to get out of your country. That's a big deal. He had what we would call at least a middle class life there, if not a little bit better. So he went to the nice restaurants. He wore the nice clothes. He had a nice home with his family. They were somewhat respected among the pagan people there. And so he wants me to leave? Now, notice this. He left his house and never owned one again for the rest of his life. He lived the rest of his life in a tent. What is faith? Being happy. However, God suits to take care of you. How many people God told you to be a missionary? Either someplace in America or someplace in the world. And you bought you a nice little home or a cottage. And you never left it because you have a home. I have a nice little house. And so when you get before God and God goes, didn't I tell you, I asked you and you told me that you would do it. Why didn't you do it? I bought a house. You know how dorky that sounds when you talk to Jehovah. I bought a, a two-bedroom house with a little puppy dog and I never went to Idaho. I never went to Mexico. I never went to China. I, 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 I had a house, God. What is faith? the ability to do what God told you to do, whether you have a house or not. Abraham got up and left his beautiful city and his home and lived the rest of his life in a tent as a pilgrim. That's how he lived. Now, we prophetic people need sermons like this. Because some of you get flaky because you don't know how to live the life of faith. You have visitations, but not a life. And I want you to have a great life, not just great events throughout your life. I want a great life with events happening by God's intervention. But I, I, I'd rather have a great life if I had to choose than have events in my life. I'd rather say, that man lived a life of faith from the beginning to the end. I, I would like that testimony. I want that for you. We have to preach it so that you know this is a great life. Abraham, get up and leave your country and leave your kindred and your father's house. That meant everything that he knew that he was emotionally attached to and secure with was over in one moment if he was going to obey. He'd say, you want to know what faith is? Hearing God. What is faith? Doing what God said. No matter how it makes you feel or what you have to do. What is faith, Abraham? He'd say, when you tell your wife, she agrees to go with you. <laughs> You're telling nice Sarah. She knows nothing about the promise that's coming or the life that is. She married this great man named Abram and thinks he's handsome and looking for a great life. And he comes home one day and says, Sarah, um, I heard a voice from heaven. Oh, what, what, what God are you talking to? I don't know his name yet. He, he's not one that we made. It's one from over, he's alive. And um, he's told me to pack up and leave the city of Earl here and go. And the logical question that should ask, where are we going? Uh, well, I don't know. We're just going. What is faith? The ability to bring stability to your family when the unknown is in front of you. 
the ability to articulate the vision of God in a way with the force that's within you, that it brings a confidence to those around about you to where they say, no problem, bags packed, we're heading out. And she, he would say, well, Sarah, you know, I don't have GPS. I don't have Google Maps. I don't even have a written map. All I got is my trust in God that when I'm supposed to go left, I'll go left. And when I'm supposed to go right, I'll go right. And when I get there, I'll know that we're there. She goes, okay. I like that kind of woman. Wow, what a nice wife that would be. A woman that believed me and trusted the voice that she heard about for the first time. So you have to look at that for a moment. She too didn't know about Jehovah. This was the beginning of a faith walk in Abraham's life and family. What is faith, Abraham? The ability to hear and to obey and to begin your journey trusting that God will take care of you every step of the way and not mourning what you have left behind. What is faith? Having more excitement for the future than emotion of the past dominating your heart and mind. That's faith. The Bible says that when Abraham left, a guy named Lot, a family member, joined him. Lot, you should study and not be like. There are some people in the Bible you should study and do the exact opposite of everything they did. And Lot is one. Lot was intrigued by Abraham. He heard about Abraham's departure and said, can I go with you? And Abraham said, well, if you want to, sure. So Lot came with Abraham on this faith journey. And by the time we get a little further in the chapter, we have a conflict that because of the journey, Abraham and Lot's wealth increased and their employees begin to fight each other. Always remember, strife starts on the outside and works its way to the inside to kill it. Notice the strife began in the herdsmen and made its way to the heart of Abraham and Lot. And the Bible says that they got together. Uh, what is faith? It's the ability to talk about your problems and try to find a true solution face to face. So Lot and Abraham got together and said, you know, our employees are, are arguing and we all have too many cows and we need to do something about this. Abraham said, well, why don't we do this? I give you first choice. If you go left, I'll take my herdsmen and herds and go right. And the Bible says that Lot looked out over all the land and chose all the plain because it had the water and the grass. He chose all of the plain. What is faith? It's the ability to give another guy first choice. And that you believe that God will take you and your leftovers and make something great come out of it. That's faith. Giving somebody else first choice. I've known whole churches to argue over a thousand dollars and fuss over a thousand dollar offering. It's not worth arguing about. A man of faith, a woman of faith, believes that the leftovers, God can whoo, breathe something grand out of it. Abraham would tell you, after Lot chose the plain, I turned to look at my leftovers. And the Lord said to Abram, as far as you can see, it's yours. What is faith? Believing the leftovers will be greater than what the God chose first. 
That's faith. That's faith. Taking the smaller meeting. Giving the other person first place. Walking away with less for the sake of peace and blessing. Trusting that God, I keep saying it because you need to hear it, will take you and the leftovers and make something great come about it. If you wanted to write my story, it could be called The Leftovers God Bless. I didn't come from wealth. I didn't come from fame. I came from country people from this state of North Carolina. My grandparents and my aunts and uncles, many of them still live out in Penderley, close to Wilmington, North Carolina. We didn't come from money. If they didn't have a farm, they'd have starved to death during the Depression. I inherited nothing but faith and the knowledge of God. I got no money when my father died. I got nothing when my grandparents passed materialistically. I got the breath of God and my hope in God. And I got the leftovers from others that ran past me, making me feel like I was second and third place. I still feel like that sometimes too. I've been preaching for over 30 years in 127 countries. I've been lied on. I've been abused, used, knocked, frammed, not given a chance to speak or to, to speak my part of something or to give my explanation of something. And I've been shoved out. I've been labeled many times unjustly and wrong and was no way to stand up and defend myself. Very few times I've been given the right to say, here is what happened according to my view. Because I was a little boy when I began. And they knocked and framed me because my crowds were bigger than theirs. And they lied on me. And I learned Abraham's lesson. You go ahead and take everything. I'll walk by myself or with the few. And I believe that God will breathe on that which I have and take the leftovers and the crumbs and make something beautiful come out of it. That is faith. And I want that in your life as students and as preachers, that no matter where you go, hopefully you'll be treated much better than I in the beginning. Thank God today I'm kissed more than bit. I, I still get bit some, but I, I think I, I've lived long enough where I'm getting a little more kisses, but I used to have red cheeks for all the wrong reasons for being slapped and bit by jealous people and them not giving me time as a young man to learn how to do things better before they kill me. So that's, that's the truth too. But my leftovers have sold millions of books that affected people around the world. My leftovers has put me here tonight with you. My leftovers, it keeps me so busy that my head says, are you ever going to slow down? I said, not until I die. That's when my holiday starts on the other side. What is faith? The ability to believe that the leftovers will be big enough to keep you blessed and busy when God touches them on your behalf. Abraham, what is faith? It is the ability to walk the land of promise while you see aliens living on your land thinking, why are you doing that to me? But knowing this is the land that God gave you. The ability to set up a residence with squatters who think it's their land and it's yours waiting for the day of promise to come to pass. That's Abraham. Abraham, if you read a little, another chapter with Lot, Lot leaves. And the next thing we find out with Lot, he has not one cow to his name, not one employee under his ownership. When I see Lot in heaven, I have a question for him. What happened to your cows? Yeah. <laughs> you, you split from the man of faith because you had too many cows and you had fussing and staff, uh, fussing herdsmen. 
and the next time you find you, you're in the pagan city of Sodom and Gomorrah with not one stinking cow. What happened to your cows, you dumb thing? And the Bible don't tell us. It just tells us that he and his family are living in Sodom and Gomorrah area and an alien army comes and attacks them and takes them captive. And Abraham hears about this. And in biblical history, Abraham was the first military general we have in the Bible. He has 318 servants, the Bible says, and he uses the word, and he trained them. What is faith? It's the ability to train soldiers for a good fight ahead of you. When I was a boy and a teenager, churches attack things in their community. They begin up on a Sunday morning because they've been provoked by God when they saw a sex shop or an adult porn place in the town flourishing, and they would tell the church, we're going to pray and attack it and protest it and drive it out of business. And that person would get the people together in prayer and natural protesting, and they'd run that thing out of business. What is faith? Attacking unrighteousness and making it stop. That's what faith is. When Abraham saw that his crazy family in their lot had been taken captive, he might be crazy, but he's my family, and you can't do that to my tribe. He trained 318 men and organized them and went back and got Lot, his family, and his goods, and that city, and set them free. And the dumb thing went back to Gomorrah and Sodom again. If I was Lot, it would be a different story. On that mountaintop with Abraham, I would have said this. I left Earl of Chaldees because there was something about you that I liked, intrigued me. And since I've joined you, I've prospered. My wealth has increased. I, I, I don't quite have what you got in me yet. So for the sake of staying together, let me sell some cows and fire some people. Let me fix the problem. I'm going to sell a couple thousand cows and get rid of them so that I might have my tent close to yours. And I might be able to walk with you and I'll take my fussy men and I'll give them a, a severance pay and tell their butts to go east and get away from us. That's what I would have done. But ignorance of youth or the arrogance of youth, spiritually speaking as well, they don't see where the blessing comes from. It happens in churches all the time. It happened in my church when I pastored in California. A nice family in the church. Their marriage got happy. Their kids got better. And then they left. And the next time you saw them, they weren't even married and the kids were crazy. People go... Why they scratch their head? Why, why? I'll tell you why. They were like Lot. They left the place of blessing and, and, and protection and got killed by the spirit that drove that out by being in a relationship with the church. You can't just leave a church where God planted you because you're offended. You can't leave a ministry that God has placed you in and around because of a controversy. We have a rule in our family. When you leave a church, you leave it when there's peace, not when there's trouble. I've never left the church when there's trouble. I've only been a member of four churches in my 50 years of life. We were not cruisomatics. We were people that knew how to stay where God planted us. And that's why me and my sister, my brother-in-law and our family, we were blessed people today because we were not schizophrenic spiritual people. We stayed where God planted us. You don't have to be the famous church. You don't have to be the biggest church. It has to be the right one for you and your family. Lot never had a cow for the rest of his life, but it was the cow and the herdsmen that divided him from his blessings. 
The next time you see Lot, Abraham's back in his life again because God's about to destroy the city where he's living. What is faith, Abraham? It's not visiting your stupid relatives when they live in the wrong city. No time do you find Abraham sending his children or his family down there to Lot's place in Sodom and Gomorrah. Not once. But not once did you ever find Lot going to visit Abraham. Abraham would come and rescue him and that'd be it. And God said, I'm going to destroy those cities. He said, but I can't do that unless I talk to Abraham, my friend. What is faith, Abraham? The ability to intercede on behalf of an idiot because it's the right thing to do. What is faith? The ability to wear someone's mud who created their own problem and to be their friend. I've been persecuted because I chose to be the friends of certain people and people groups. Some things don't change unless a kind voice is in the ear of those people or people groups. And one reason why some groups never change is not a voice of God amongst them. Because the church persecutes the messenger to the point they feel something's wrong and darkness stays in charge. The first, one of the first men that ordained me was Buddy Harrison, Ken Hagen's son-in-law. And I was at his office the day he ordained me and he had just ordained the man that built this territory called PTL, Jim Baker. And he was ordained by Buddy Harrison after all the drama. So there was in the newspapers. It was everywhere. And I happened to be joining the same group in the same season. And it didn't look logically right to join the group that was ordaining Jim Baker because Jim Baker at that time was the worst man in Christendom. Now, we know that's not true. That's the way the attitude was at that time. Some of you can remember that. Others, you have to study it and you still won't get it because you didn't live through it. When you live through something, you have the emotional scar or the emotional memory. When you read something, it's different. And that's why you can read history and go, oh, that's not good, but he's still a good guy. If you live through what they live through, mm, they have a different emotion. That's why you have to know how to understand people's talk about people. And I asked him, I said, I have a question. Why are you ordaining Jim Baker? After all the drama, he goes, well, one, he's called of God and he deserves it. A gift does not end just because there's been a mistake or some trouble. I thought, okay, I can, I can take that. And he says, plus, I'm his friend. I said, why? I've always asked questions. I'll never forget what he said to me, and it changed my life. He said, when a man's down, he needs a kind voice and a strong hand to lift him up. He said, the Lord told him when he began his apostolic, we call it apostolic ministries, we know it today, to ordain and take care of ministers. He said, for me to be the friend of even those who have made great mistakes. He says, because a person that is hurting or made a mistake, will never listen to a man that's thrown an egg or a rock at him. But if you can speak kind words and be a friend, there comes a moment in everybody's life when they go, maybe there's something I did that I need to fix. And they won't call the folks who did bad them. They'll call the person who's been kind and been nice and been pleasant. I walked out of that office that day with a new thing in my heart that I want to be the friend of those people too. I want to be the guy that calls them and says, how are you doing? Let's go to lunch. And go to lunch and just talk and have a good time and be a friend. 
and wait for a moment that may or may not come to be the one that might be able to say something or help redirect something in a person's life. Some of those I never got a chance to talk to. I was just their friend. A few called me sometime and said, what about this? And I was able to share some things that helped make some different movements in their heart and mind. I was so thrilled that I didn't run off because of public Christian pressure. What is faith, Abraham? To help Lot out when the dumb thing is living in the wrong town, socializing with the wrong people, having his girls date bisexual men, and God's going to kill the whole place, and he is so deaf spiritually, he can't even hear God for himself. That's faith. Are you enjoying my message? This is called the life of faith. What is faith, Abraham? It's making altars and paying tithes. All through Abraham's life, if you read his story, he built altars every place he went. And it says that he was one of the first to pay tithes before the Levitical, Levitical law of tithes. So this argument over tithing, is it New Testament, Old Testament? Oh, shut up. It's called a faith life of tithing. When you serve God and love God, you give to him altars and tithes because it's how you live with God. And you that are arguing it aren't living with God. You're playing a religious game. What is faith, Abraham? It's the ability to build altars and put something on top of it that God wants to like and consume. In the early 1900s, there was a part of the Christian culture. They used a term called the family altar. You might ever heard that term. We don't use it today, but let me just kind of bring you a quick definition of what it was. It was a time of prayer for the family, not just in the church. It's when dad and mom and the children and other members of the home would get together normally daily, if not two or three times a week, and read their Bible and pray together and discuss things. It was a home group with actual members of that home in it. And they would worship God and pray together and study the Bible. Mom and Dad would teach the children the Bible stories. It wasn't just left for Sunday school or cell groups or super church when you come to church. The family taught it to the kids. Then they would do things like this. We want to do something as a family for God. And they would pray as a family or talk about it, and they would come up with something that that family would do. Either they would give half of their Christmas money to the poor, or they would give Christmas meal and go down as a whole family and not cook one there or go to their grandmother's house and grandpa's house. They would go and help feed the poor on Christmas Day. Or they would say, Twice a month for the next six months, we four are going to go down and clean the church so they're ready for it on Sunday morning. Or we're going to go down there and we're going to help take care of the elderly and make sure they get to church. We're going to give ourselves life. And the kids were involved, the teenagers were involved, because it was a family thing they decided to do to give themselves to God like that. What is faith, Abraham. It's building altars and putting a sacrifice on them that God will consume. When's the last time you and your wife and children decided to give God something more than your two hours on Sunday and a little check? Maybe it should be a bigger check and more time. Maybe it should be something else you do in the house of God or other things you can do, take care of the elderly in your community, on your street. We're going to make sure that this elderly couple's grass is mowed, that their groceries are in their cupboards full. We're going to take care. We're going to build an altar of godly sacrifice and service because we love God and God desires us to treat our fellow man this way. 
That's faith. Whether anybody else does it or not, whether anybody else applauds you or recognizes you, you do it. It's called a family altar. What is faith? It's tithing without feeling an obligation. He brought and gave 10% of all that he had to Melchizedek. Do you tithe? <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> if you argue, tithing's not New Testament. Tithing's old and legalistic. Uh, tithing began before there was the law. It began as a part of the life of faith in Abraham. So if you're going to live by faith, you're going to give whether it's new or old because it's how you serve and worship God. It is a part of your worship. Good morning, everybody. Hey, Brother Roberts, I liked your sermon to that point. Yeah, that's what I thought. Now, what is faith? It's building altars and giving tithes to God's people. You look at him and he says, I'm not done. Faith is looking at a wife that is old as you are. And you've been told something by God. He would say, faith is having a covenant with God. Most people don't know what a, a covenant is. Genesis 17. Abraham was 90 years old and nine. And the Lord appeared to Abram, said, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be perfect or sincere. And I make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him. And here's what God said. As for me, behold, my covenant between me and you. And you shall be a father of many nations. And neither shall your name be called Abram anymore, but you shall be Abraham. For I'll make many nations out of you. What is faith, Abraham. It is dealing with God in a covenantal way. He says, my covenant is between me and you, not 50 other people. What is your covenant with God? We have the biblical Logos covenant with God. But then we have the Rhema covenant that God spoke something particularly between you and Jehovah. I have several covenants. One of my covenants has blessed you. That's why I'm here. I was 12 and a half years old when Christ walked through the front door of my house and he told me, study the lives of my generals. Know why they succeeded and why some failed. For there will come a generation who will seek out that which I will reveal to you if you are faithful to do what I've asked you to this day. And by that, you will help salvage, save, and impart gifts unto them around about you. And I will cause the generals of your day to become your friends throughout the world. And a few other things. How many have ever read one of my general books? How many knows what I'm talking about when I say the generals? Before I came along, they were called heroes of the faith. Now the world all calls them generals because of me and my covenant. He made a covenant with a 12 and a half year old boy watching Laverne and Shirley on television. That's how it come that day. That's how all this has come about. The first set of videos I made when I was in my early 20s, sold over a million sets. That means there was 12 million VHS copies. It scared me and my publisher. And I realized I have a covenant that works because I studied. I still do it today. 
You walk in my hotel room, you'll find the books around my bed. I travel with them reading. I've studied over 500 ministries in my life so far. Read over 14,000 books, my librarian tells me. Why? I have a covenant. Now, you may never have to do that. You can be blessed by the fruit of my covenant. And you should be happy. You have to read all those big, thick books with no pictures in them. <laughs> you have to read all those things that I had to endure and go to libraries instead of playing basketball and dating pretty girls. I needed old women that knew famous preachers. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't get a kiss at the end of the night. You got, ha, ka, shavaka, hi, hi. And that's what you got when it was all over. <laughs> and that's more true than you all know. But that was my covenant. I don't mourn what I had to give up for it because I've been blessed by keeping it. I have known the great Christian leaders of my lifetime since I was a teenager. I'd be sitting sometimes in Oral Roberts' office or in the hotel room with Kenneth Hagin or, you know, name them all from around the world. Some of them you would not know because they're not known in this country. The great generals of Asia or Africa or Eastern Europe, Australia. And I'd sit there and think, how did I get here? Because I'm not famous. I didn't come from fame. I didn't come from wealth. I didn't come from all the things that give you that platform. But I had a covenant. And I'd be sitting there and God t would tell me sometimes, I told you when you were 12 years old watching Laverne and Shirley that if you would do, I would do, and you did, and I'm doing. What is faith? The ability to hear God make a covenant with you and keep it whether anybody else understands it or not. When I'd be reading all those books, I would go to school with all my school books, and I'd have me a, a Christian biography on, the, on two. And when we would finish our class early, instead of talking, I'd be reading Miss Kuhlman's story, or Wesley's story, or Luther, and my friends would go, what are you reading? I said, I'm reading a biography about a great preacher. Ooh. And they'd make fun of me. They don't anymore. They don't anymore. I kept my covenant as a teenager. When all my friends dated pretty girls and married the wrong human. I was in libraries with old women and grumpy old men. Talking to them about the things of God. That was my covenant. I kept it. I kept it. What is faith, Abraham. It's getting a new name. He went from Abram to Abraham. You'll get a new name if you live by faith. Hopefully it'll be a nice one like Abraham and not some of those crazy names you get called later in life. Like you're a faith healer. You're one of those crazy prophetic people. That's a new name. It may not be said real nicely, but you got a new name. I'm that general's guy. You're the general's guy. I like my name. You're one of those tongue-talking revival general's guy. I'm he. I always say, I'm he. Never be ashamed of your covenant or your name. I got one. Hope you get one too. Maybe you'll get two or three in your life. What is faith, Abraham? It's the ability... To have a child when your body says you can't. <laughs> Romans 4 says, he didn't stagger at the promise. But he called those things that be not as though they were. What is faith? It's talking. Your son is already here when he's not here yet. It's playing with him when there's no ball to be played with yet. That's faith. He goes, but that wasn't the hardest thing about my son. Faith is, when he was 12 years old, God told me to go build an altar. My son Isaac had, had built altars with him before, with Abraham. 
So he told Isaac, we're going to go three days journey and we're going to make an altar. Oh, good. Because Abraham was putting his faith in his children. What is faith, Abraham? Genesis 18 says that Abraham would command his children and his household after the Lord. Faith is the ability to put your faith in the belly of your child that he'll live after for, with for God after you're dead. That's faith. The ability to put your faith in the belly of your child that when you're dead for a hundred years, they'll still be shouting God's praise stronger than you when you're alive. So he'd been training Isaac for 10, 12 years, loving his little boy because he's a boy of promise. And God tapped him on the shoulder. I want you to sacrifice your son to me. Okay. Isaac, we're leaving tomorrow morning for a three-day journey to sacrifice. And Isaac was happy because he liked helping dad build altars and, and because that, he'd been doing that since he was a little, 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 little boy. And about a day and a half out, he goes, Dad, he forgot something. Where's the goat or the lamb? It's okay, I got it all under control. And they start building the altar. Isaac and them find the stone, put the wood, and Isaac kept saying, Dad, Dad, where, where's the sacrifice? <laughs> Hebrews 11 says that Abraham was counting God able to raise his boy from the dead after the sacrifice. What is faith, Abraham? It's keeping everything out of your relationship between you and God, even the promises you've gotten in your life. How many people you and I know God blesses them, and they start to backslide. What is faith? The ability to keep the connection, the relationship between you and God clear of everything and anything else but God and you. That's first. And he said to Isaac, son, you're it. Now, I'm of the opinion, but I could be wrong, so you take this in the light. I think there was enough faith in Abraham that Isaac was not as shaken as you would have assumed. I think he knew his daddy's walk. And when he said, when you die on this altar, how I got you here is how I'll get you back. I count God able to raise you from the dead and keep his promise that I will be the father of many nations. Can you give up your life and your ministry believing that what God promised you will come back to you? Can you keep your handsome husband, your gorgeous wife, out of first place and keep God there? And make him or her two and your children three. Did you marry a human that would permit you to live like that? I've been almost married twice. And one of the reasons why I didn't marry the one that I loved the most was she did not want God to be number one. She wanted that place. And after a while, I had to decide what did I want. As much as I loved her, I didn't love her that much to give her God's place in my heart. My God has been good to me. When I was little and all through my life, 
in my mistakes and in my blessings, he's been good. I'd rather be single than have God second in my life. I'd rather be without a family, if that's what it cost me, than to have God number three or four in my life. That's my choice. I chose to live like this. I don't want anybody's mourning or pity. I want you to live the life of faith yourself. What is faith? Keeping God number one at all times and having a family that celebrates God as priority over them in your life. They realize that the blessing flows beautifully when the divine order is kept this way. Can I give you a few more before I close? I don't get to teach as much as I'd like sometimes, but tonight I wanted to start this before I begin some of the general things tomorrow. What is faith, Abraham? It's finding a wife for your son, making sure he marries the right human. That's faith. <laughs> Brother Robert, that's funny. Really now. Genesis 24. This is where I start losing people. In Genesis 24, Abraham was old and well stricken in age, verse 1. And the Lord blessed Abraham in all the things. And Abraham said, Unto his eldest and most trusted servant, Put, I pray thee, your hand under my thigh. That's how they swore in those days. Today we shake hands and we swear like that. Back then they did. I like our way better. <laughs> but that's what that is. So don't get freaky. Just be glad you're born in America this time when we shake hands, okay? <laughs> I love the Bible. It's all there, isn't it? It's, just, it's so fun. And he said to his servant, put your hand under my thigh and swear. By the Lord God of heaven and the God of earth, that you'll not take a wife for my son, among the daughters of the Canaanites where we dwell. I don't want my son marrying one of these idiots that we live beside. They have no cherishedness about them in God. Their morality, forget them. Nah. You go back where we came from and get him a wife. And the servant goes, what if you don't want to come back? That's why he's a servant. He can't hear God and obey. That's why he wasn't a man of power himself. He had no faith. Abraham said, shut up and go. The angel got to go before you and all we work out. Just give her and get her. What is faith, Abraham? That you help your child marry the right human before you're dead. How many of you had a cute little baby? You changed his or her diaper and fed him. You put him through school and when it came time to say, I do, he walked out and that's why they didn't. And it fell apart. Faith is making sure that your children marry the right person. Good preaching, Brother Roberts. You're asking Abraham what faith is? This is a story. And she came happily and married Isaac and became one of the great Bible stories of a marriage. Not because he was so smart. Because Abraham, his dad, had faith enough in God and understood family genealogy that he can't be left to his hormones to figure out which one's right. That's what happened to Samson. That's why he died early. He kept telling his family, I want her. They should have hit him up so they with a two by four and said, I'll pick her. Your hormones are too big to decide for yourself. Now sit down and shut up or take a cold shower and I'll go find her for you. And Sam would have had a better life. Y'all know it's true. 
I'm not trying to be mean, but it's, it's right here. He did this. Cool off until you find the right one. I'll tell you a secret. I guess it's on camera. When I started pastoring in California, the most shocking thing I dealt with the first few years of my pastoring was keeping single people out of bed with each other and getting married folks back into bed with each other. And I'll let you process that later. That's what I figured out. That was the most odd thing I had to deal with. And I thought, it's legal. Go for it. And they wouldn't do it. The other folks couldn't hang contain. Ah, they're crazy. Pastoring is unusual. You need God's grace to do it and not lose your mind. Besides, you want to slap them. Bam. That's my counsel today. But you can't do that. What is faith, Abraham? It's helping your kids marry the right person. What is faith, Abraham? Making sure in their belly lives the love of God that you have for God is in them. That when you're dead, they still sing God's praises. They still talk God's talk. Pursue God's path. And help your grandbabies do better than them. What is faith, Abraham? I'm getting close to the end. I have 28 points, but I can't preach them all. It's going to be one of my new books. What is faith? What is faith, Abraham? In Genesis 25 and 5. He gave all that he had to Isaac. And to the sons of the concubines, Abraham, that that had these, these other children, he gave them gifts or inheritance and sent them away from Isaac, his son, What is faith, Abraham? It's the ability to write your will out and execute it before you're dead. I've had the honor of knowing three men of modern time that defined faith for our generation. Or Roberts, Kenneth Hagin, and Lester Summerall. Now, I know there's others, but these are the ones I knew. These names most of you would know, at least one or two of them. I knew them in a personal way. I played basketball with their kids and their grandkids, too, so I knew them and their families. I know them still today. But each of these I just listed did not execute a will correctly. Or Roberts had four children. Two of them died tragically. One by suicide and another one by plane crash. He has two living today, Roberta and Richard, great people, good people. But they don't get along. When Or Roberts died, not one of his family was in charge of the university that he built that took 40 years of his life to build. If I would have been Oral Roberts, I'd have called my two children to my house and locked the door. And I would have talked, and we would have talked, and we would have prayed, and we would have talked, and got through whatever it was that kept them from being coexistence together, or we would have died in that house. His daughter is an educated lawyer in the state of Oklahoma. Her mind has been trained to run any institution legally correctly. I said, on my daughter rest the responsibility of this university to run it right and to keep God in the middle of what I have done. My mantle divides this way. Roberta, you get this. Richard, 
You take the media healing ministry and you go to the nations through TV and crusades preaching and praying for the sick and saving the souls. And this is how my mantle falls. And I would have called all my partners together and friends. And I would have said, I'm getting old and I'm going to die. And I have brought my children. And we have worked out our difficulties. And we've come to the place of a divine ceiling. And on my daughter rests the responsibility to keep this university accredited, respected, but where people can come and get their learning and keep their spiritual burning. And on my son rest the anointing to heal and save the people of the world. I ask you and your children to watch my two children and when they show fruits of this working, for you to join them as you have joined me with your prayers, your finances, and send your children that we may train them in a place where God is God while they are learning. And millions of people around the world would have cheered it and have done it. But that didn't happen because he didn't write a will and execute it. Kenneth Hagen has two wonderful children, a daughter and a son, and they don't get along. If I would have been Brother Hagen, I'd have brought my children to my house <laughs> and locked the door. And we would have talked and we would have prayed and talked and prayed and fixed whatever it was, and then have it sealed. And it would have fell like this. My prophetic pr mantle rests upon my daughter, Pat. She carries the fullness of my prophetic office and teaching ministry. My son carries the beginning of my life my pastoral and evangelistic crusade where he drove two million miles by car in the first part of his life. I'd have brought my partners and ministers together and said, I have had a divine discussion with my children. My daughter will rule this way. My son will rule this way. When they show fruits that it is true and you see it, I ask you at that moment, would you pray with them? Would you partner financially with them? And would you send those children of yours that are called to minister and build churches to my Rama school that they may be trained again to go to, go to another generation? But that didn't happen. And it didn't happen in Brother Summerall's life either. What is faith, Abraham? the ability to understand your natural and spiritual will and execute it that it may thrive in the new day after you're gone. That's faith. Most Christians never figure that one out. What is faith, Abraham? It's the ability to die in peace. What is faith? It is that substance that carries you from this world to the other one in joy and peace. He died full of days and his two sons buried. I've been at the bedside of some people that died scared. I was at the bedside of others who couldn't wait to go. They were so ready, they were bouncing out of their body before it was time. They were doing early visits to heaven and coming back. They were trying to get out a few days early before God said, it's not quite 
time. You got three more days. Would you just hang on? Faith is that thing, that substance that carries you from earth into eternity without anxiety. That's faith. I didn't have the chance to tell you this one. Or about another 15 of them. I'm going to close because we're going to be here tomorrow on the, tomorrow night. What is faith, Abraham? It's having Ishmael. What is faith? The ability to get up from your mistakes and sin and finish your destiny. The ability to get up out of the shame, out of the talk, out of the resistance and finish what God told you to do. He had an Ishmael before he had an Isaac. But he got Isaac, and he finished and became the father of many nations. Tonight, I took you on a quick journey through the greatest human of faith that the world has ever known. He was greater than Wigglesworth and Martin Luther. He was greater than anybody we admire in our present day life, Abraham. I tried to teach you the life of faith by looking at the man of faith. What is faith? Hearing God's voice in darkness. What is faith? Obeying what he told you to do without a map. What is faith? Giving somebody else first choice that you believe the leftovers that God can breathe on and make something great come out of it. What is faith? Making covenant with God and keeping it. What is faith? Building altars all through your life. Not just in the beginning when you're young, but when you're big and smart and famous. You do the same thing then too. What is faith? Tithing all that you have, including your time, to God with a smile without being made to or feel guilty to do it. What is faith? Getting a new name and liking it. What is faith? The ability to have children and teach them the ways of God that when you're dead, they'll still obey God better than you. What is faith? Calling things that be not as though they were. What is faith? Finding a wife for your son, a husband, for your daughter, so they marry the right one and live happily ever after. What is faith? The ability to write a will and execute it before you're dead so there's no fussing after you're gone. What is faith? The ability to get up from your sin, your mistakes, and finish your duty to God and man in spite of your mistakes. What is faith? The ability to die in peace and joy. I pray for you tonight that God will help you to recognize unbelief and doubt. I pray for you tonight that a new life of faith will come alive inside of you. A pursuant from the depths of your inner person that you will a life with God and not just events. That you will live a life of faith and not be known as a person of one or two events of faith. That you will die with bigger faith than you have tonight. You will die with your children 
singing God's praises as you transfer to the other side. You will die with faith bigger than when you started. I pray for God to walk with you, to talk with you, and for you to have a life of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give God a good shout if you would. Hallelujah. Did you enjoy that? See you in the morning. God bless you. Wow. Pastor. Don't go anywhere just yet. <laughs> wow. I think we should just seal off for a minute on that. Whew. When we asked Roberts to come be with us, he just said yes. Didn't send us an invoice, didn't say book my ticket, book my hotel, do this, do that. He just showed up yesterday. Just here, he's on faith. And so I want us all to sow in faith, just like what he talked about tonight. I want him to leave here blessed. He didn't, add, he didn't put a, he didn't say I want a dime for anything. I'm coming because I want to bless you guys. And so we didn't have to sign a contract with him like we do with most people. He just said, I'm, I'm just, I'll just, I'll be there. And somehow he just arrived last night and here he is. And so uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that heart. And so I want you guys to sow into, into him and what's, what you're receiving tonight. And uh, continue to come back tomorrow night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning. Come back to the school in the mornings. If you can't make it in the evenings, whew, come for the school tomorrow. Yeah, 9 a.m. tomorrow and 10 a.m. on Friday. And... Uh, just just soak it in. Just soak it in. Learn about the generals. Learn about faith. Learn about all these things. And the theme of this week is live in your high calling. Don't just visit it. <laughs> Don't just encounter it every now and then. And so uh you know it's it's funny around these parts when people when there's revival meetings or whatever going on and you get we just had an almost three-week revival meeting. And a lot of people I talked to, they're like, well, yeah, I went one night. <laughs> that doesn't transform a lot of things. And, man, you got to really let the Lord stir it up inside of you and grow. Amen. So I want you to sow tonight in faith, in faith. I hope you were encouraged in your faith tonight. Amen. Wow. You can make your checks out to the Secret Place Church. We're going to cut Roberts a really gigantic check on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> yes. And uh, you can give through our Secret Place Church app. If you're watching on Facebook or if you're watching on Fresh Fire or secretplacechurch.com, you can just click the Give button. And uh, we'll take care of everything from there. Amen. Amen. Is everybody ready to sow? Wow, three of you. <laughs> Constance is still writing. That's fine. It's M-I-L-L-I-O-N. You can put a 10 in front of that if you want to. That's fine. Everybody ready? Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this word we received tonight. I pray that we all continue to grow in faith and step out in those things as uncomfortable as it may be, as scary and as wild as it may be. Whew. <laughs> we walk in that ability that you've given to us, that you created us in our mother's wombs. Amen. And so we sow into this in the name of Jesus, knowing God that as we give, you will continue to give. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Amen. All right, well, ushers, go ahead and come forward. You can click that donate button online. Give that way. Amen.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, I'm just... Uh, <laughs> Where's my worship team at? You guys come on up. We'll just close with a little worship song. This, I really feel like we just should see line this for a few minutes and just, I don't want us to get lost in worship. I want to get lost in this word and let that word just settle in. So I just, we'll just worship together for a little bit, spend a little bit of time letting the Lord put this in our hearts deep. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You are living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is under in your presence Lord so Holy Spirit you are welcome here. come flood this place and fill the Long for to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare You are living hope Your presence Lord. I've tasted and seen Of the sweetest of love Where my heart becomes free and the shame is under in your face. Long. 
your presence, Lord, to be overcome, Lord, to be overcome, Lord, to be overcome, Lord. Just go blessed. We'll see you tomorrow morning or tomorrow night. He has lots of books back there. Buy every single one of them, please. Support him as ministry by buying everything he's got back there. Mm -hmm.